with y'all, man. It is Black Balloon, and I am happy to be back making a video with y'all. So y'all already know what's going on. All right, y'all. Now we are here to talk about Nickelodeon, the dark side of Nickelodeon, as a good bit of y'all have been requesting since I last dropped a video, right? So as we all know by now, this comes to light with Drake Bell doing that docuseries that was called Quiet On Set. And he basically tells his story. Now, if you've kept up with Drake Bell and Nickelodeon and, you know, all of the allegations that have went against some of the filmmakers, producers, dialogue coaches, as far as Brian Pegg, when he was convicted back, I think, in 2004, and he was required to register as a sex offender. So it's been long known what he was about. You know, this video is going to go into Dan Snyder as well, who I think is... You know, he's he's probably the biggest monster in this video. It's all pretty sick when you think about it, but this is stuff that we've known that's been going on in Hollywood for a very long time. But of course, in 2024, a lot of this stuff is coming to light. And the things that we've been talking about for a long time, you know, we're actually we're actually able to have proof of it now, you know, or at least as far as people getting to the point where, you know, they're telling you what's been going on. You know, you no longer have to be like, you know, this is what they do in Hollywood, but you don't have that definitive proof. Now people are actually telling their stories and um, everything that's been done is coming to the light. So I don't want to do this video, you know, to where it's like going all over the place. I do want to let y'all hear clips that's kind of been circling around the Internet as far as Drake Bell telling his story of Brian Peck and how it all started in the beginning. I definitely think it's worth a listen if y'all haven't heard it by now. We'll also go into the clips that are behind the scenes of, you know, Dan Snyder, um, I think Amanda Bynes, Ariana Grande, Leonardo DiCaprio, all of the weird little stuff that hinted to what was actually going on, you know, at Nickelodeon in Hollywood. Um, we'll get into all that stuff without, you know, being all over the place because I think a lot of it is definitely worth seeing. Um, and it tells a story without them actually admitting to what happened. You know, a lot of the stuff that they were doing was very sexualized, like right in our faces. You know, it's kind of like how Disney was doing it as well. There's a bunch of symbolism that's very sexual and little kids obviously don't really know what they're looking at, but it's there. You know, it, it seeps into your subconscious and it's something that you don't really realize until years later. And you're like, oh, wow, shit, that's what that was. And it's the same thing that was going on at Nickelodeon. So, look, we'll go ahead and use this video to jump into it all, man. Um, we'll go into the first clip of Drake Bell telling his story. Um, so for those who haven't seen it, we'll go ahead and react to it right now. Check this out. There was this time that I was at her house and Brian had planned to take me to Disneyland. I was like, this is not happening. I'm not going, I don't know. And Brian's calling my cell phone nonstop. I was just ignoring it. Well, he started calling my girlfriend's house nonstop. I mean, over and over and over and over. Finally, her mom answered and brought it to me. And he's like, what are you doing? We had plans. People are watching me on the phone. So I just played it off as like, I must have made double plans, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hang here tonight. And he got really upset and I hung up the phone. And he started calling back and calling back. My girlfriend's mom said, hey, Drake, can I talk to you in the kitchen for a second? She shuts the door behind me, so, you know, so it's just the two of us. She's like, what's going on? And I go, oh, yeah, Brian, look, we, we had plans. She goes, no, 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 no. A 40-something-year-old man does not call my daughter's boyfriend like that. My girlfriend's mom asked, what's going on? And I go, 
oh, you know, he is, he is kind of strange. I'm trying to distance myself from him because like things are getting a little weird. So she took matters into her own hands. She called my mom, she's like, I'm taking Drake to see our therapist tomorrow because something, something is going on and we need to figure it out because it seems like he's in quite a bit of danger. And so I went to the therapist and I just was so scared to just say anything. I didn't know how to explain it. I mean, I still don't. I mean, I'm still like, you know, I've never talked about this outside of therapy, which, and, uh, um, And I just, I just said, nah, you know, it's, everything's, everything's normal. It's just, you know, things are getting a little, little weird, but, but nothing's happened. But think, you know, good thing we, we caught it when we did, you know. Realized it was just so calculated, that, you know, it's just like, I was like, wow, you got, you, you moved all the pieces into place. The whole thing was mental manipulation. He was so integrated in all of these different productions and knew these directors and these producers that if I were to say anything or do anything, that he had the ability to basically go, well, you're never gonna work with this person, you're never gonna work with that person. So it was me believing that I would never be able to do this ever again. And I would have to go figure out how to whack surfboards or, you know. I didn't want to risk that. You know, I was doing what I love to do. And, and so I just kept it inside. I went to production and said, you know, I really am very uncomfortable with this guy, Brian Peck always being around my son. I go, I don't see anything abnormal, but it just doesn't, I don't have a good feeling. And she goes, oh, well, I don't know if you knew it or not, but he's gay. Maybe you're just homophobic and you just, you know, you just don't understand that that's, he's a touchy-feely guy. So I said, okay. And then it just, it just kept not setting well with me. So I told people on the set, and I was ostracized. Now the ending of that clip is exactly what I was waiting on without actually knowing I was waiting on it, right? So when I first saw it, just like in the back of my mind, I knew that part was coming, you know? Because that's the part where like the cult comes into hand, comes into play, is all of these guys are a part of the same group, you know? This Nickelodeon, Disney, the creators of Rick and Morty, cartoons, you know, um, The Simpsons, you know, um, they're all the same. They're all a part of the same sex cult, you know. It, it even, it even reminds me of the Hellfire Club with Stranger Things. Y'all remember, we did a video about that over a year ago where they were promoting the Hellfire Club and Stranger Things, and little did we know, it it was a sex cult in the, what, 1800s? Or something like that. So I think it might have started even before that. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It, these are the same people, you know, a part of the same families, bloodlines, all tied together. And it's all about sex, and magic and rituals and them being able to do whatever they want and dangling your career in your face. That's why I said I was waiting on that part. I was waiting on him to be like, you know, he had all of these connections and basically if I didn't say anything, if I kept my mouth shut, I could continue doing what I love to do. And now mind you, they're all very young. They're, you know, I think no younger than 13 or 14 at that time. If I'm not mistaken, Drake Bell was around 15. They're young, so they're not, you know, grown men and women that have the, you know, mental state to 
you know, be like, hell no, I'm out of here. You know, I know what's going on, you know, but, you know, don't, don't, don't get it wrong. I'm pretty sure they, they had moments where they recognized how uncomfortable they were, you know, especially the females. Um, and we're going to get into that a little bit more with Amanda Bynes and Ariana Grande. But them being so young, you know, at the same time, they're just doing it because this is what they feel they have to do or go along with because they're still at an age where they can be manipulated. You know, they're, they're still very young. So to these grown 30 and 40 year old men, they take advantage of that. And that's the sickest part of it. Have them acting out skits and things that they don't really think is so, you know, evil or, you know, they don't really think this is sexual, but, you know, the people who wrote the script, they know what's going on. You know, like they know what they're getting them to promote and sexualize. That's why I brought up Disney, because this right here is really important as far as recognizing how they like to infiltrate into little kids' minds. The mind of a little kid or a young teen being very impressionable. And the fact that you could almost get them to do whatever you want them to do, which in turn influences thousands and millions of other kids. That's why Nickelodeon and Disney is like, it's like a recruiting process almost, you know? They recruit. <laughs> they polish, they indoctrinate kids, young teens, and it's sick. And this is the world that we've been living in and watching for a very long time. And this gives us a little bit more insight to just how evil this world can be, even down to, you know, the smallest things. But it's very important to realize how they like to get to little kids and young teens, y'all. They couldn't recruit me. They couldn't recruit you and do the things that they do. So they catch you when you're 10 years old and you don't know anything about anything. And they use you. It's exactly why I brought up the thing with Stranger Things. How many young kids and teens watch it and they don't know what the Hellfire Club was. That blew my mind, honestly. When we did that video, they had Hellfire everything. Shirts, shoes, hats. Everybody wanted to wear it and be a part of the Hellfire Club because it was so cool. Like the fans of Dustin and Will and Mike. I think we all watched the show. I watched the show. But, you know, it's crazy how they use it to promote these same sex cults. It's crazy, y'all. Um, so, you know, we'll go ahead and use this time to jump into the next clip. Um, I got a couple more I want to react to. So with that being said, y'all, check this out. You see, we draw drawings of each other. Brian is the famous artist, and we always make fun of each other and portray each other in silly, satirical ways. Leo's job on this set, for some reason, is to make fun of me all day long. Leo, as you know, is the latest, hottest, hunkiest teen idol there is. Yeah, muscles. <laughs> Look, speaking of hunky, huh? I remember at the time, I think it was about like two and a half years in, everyone went to Brian's house for a barbecue and his house was a little off. He had a room that was just dedicated to like vintage toys and comic books and he converted his garage into like a Planet of the Apes shrine. I noticed a painting in the room that stuck out to me because it had nothing to do with Planet of the Apes. It was of a birthday clown holding balloons. And Brian got very excited when I asked him about it. He flipped the thing around and on the back it said, to Brian, I hope you enjoy the painting. Best wishes, your friend, John Wayne Gacy. It was a self-portrait of serial killer, John Wayne Gacy. At this point, I'm like 14. I didn't know like the details, but I knew like 
this guy's a serial killer who like killed a lot of young men and boys. My instinct was like, everyone has to see this. And so like all the parents and the kids come into the room and then Brian presents the painting again. And Brian actually developed a pen pal relationship with John. He kept like this pile of letters and photos from John Wayne Gacy in his nightstand next to his bed. And he like pulls them out and starts showing them to me. Your instinct is to give someone the benefit of the doubt. If you've known them for that long, even in the face of like this really bad sign, it was one of those like classic failures of group psychology. Now that part may have shocked me the most when it comes to Brian Peck. Now, am I surprised? No, I'm not, because I'm pretty sure there's a study and a correlation between serial killers, especially a guy like John Wayne Gacy that raped and murdered, as they put it, over 33 young men and women. You know, remember that number 33? which we talked about John Wayne Gacy when we did the video with uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Remember the connection there? Um, you know, y'all wanna check it out, you could go all the way back to the Jeffrey Dahmer video, but we, we talked about him a good bit in that video as well. But like I was saying, I'm pretty sure there's similarities in serial killers who are interested and the fact that the younger they are, the more like exciting the kill is, I guess, or, you know, the more they're mentally turned on, even physically turned on by the younger they are. I'm pretty sure there's a relation with, you know, guys like Brian Peck, um, Dan Schneider, you know, so on and so on. Grown men who prey on young kids there's definitely a relation. So I'm not surprised that he may have had an obsession with John Wayne Gacy and then he became like pen pals with him. You know, they probably shared multiple interests in what they were about as men. Now thinking about that, it just makes everything come together and it's even more sick than we'd imagine. The things that really go on behind the scenes, you know? And I remember when we did the Jeffrey Dahmer video, we were tying together things that shouldn't have been tied together between two serial killers, you know, especially using that number 33. And that just goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that all these guys are a part of the same cult. Because remember, I think in that video, I was making a point of this being orchestrated, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, being allowed to do what they were doing, being some kind of like psychological project or, you know, some kind of military project. You know, I, I can't admit, remember exactly what we were talking about, but I know I was making a connection that some of this stuff may not just be this random guy who decided to, you know, become a serial killer. Some of this stuff may have been orchestrated in a sense. When that number 33 comes into play, you know, you have to consider everything because that's not a coincidence. And to have that connect back to someone who, you know, was a filmmaker, producer, dialogue coach with Nickelodeon and so on. That is insane for these two to be connected, who the average person would think that their worlds would never cross paths with each other. And even the thing with him and Leonardo DiCaprio and how I think that was Drake Bell's dad that said he didn't like how touchy-feely he was, but he was told that the guy was gay and that's just, you know, what he does to not worry about it. It's, it's okay. Seeing Leonardo DiCaprio, a lot of the comments was like, yo, that must be why he's never settled down 
he's always in a relationship with a woman that's, what does it say, like no older than 25 or something like that. And he drops him and finds him another young woman. You know, like things that happen in our childhoods, especially things that traumatize you or shape you to be a certain way, you end up living that the rest of your life if you don't figure it out, if you don't get help. And that very well could have been a part of who he is now. 99% sure it is. And it shaped him to be who he is. And I'm pretty sure he went through things a lot deeper than what we know right now. And it more may come out about Leonardo DiCaprio. But just seeing that 20 seconds of him and the guy Peck, just seeing that 20 seconds gave us everything we needed to know. Because that was that was way too much touching. It looked very comfortable between them two. And, you know, Peck just saying at the end, like, look at this guy. You know, like, he's a hunk or whatever, whatever. They seemed, he seemed way too comfortable. And, like I said, we could just only imagine it. So, I think right here we'll end this video, part one. Um, like I said, I don't want to do it to where it's all over the place. I think part two will focus a little bit more on Dan Schneider, Amanda Bynes, and Ariana Grande. So I don't want to forget that. We're going to add that into it. Um, and a couple of other things, too. Um, so I think we'll save that for part two. Y'all let me know, you know, what y'all think about this video. Definitely, if y'all want that part two, I'm, I'm going to make it regardless. But, um... There, there's definitely more to talk about. With that being said, man, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. Please let me know what y'all think about this in the comments. And with that being said, it's Black Balloon, and I'm going to see y'all soon.